Hello folks, welcome back to World War 2 TV and another one of our little bonus shows that don't really sit in with the theme of the week, although it kind of does in general terms in that it was a threat that the Allies had to deal with. So um, there are people watching in Australia, so it's good evening to you, it's good, it's midday if you're in the UK, it's the afternoon if you're in um, the Middle East, so it's a range of people watching from different places today. So one of the things we've talked a lot about on World War 2 TV is the formation of special units to deal with special problems that were faced in World War 2, so the command those airborne forces, code breaking teams, things like that. One of the things that we haven't as yet tackled is the formation of a unit to deal with a, basically a plague of locusts. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. My guest, Dr. Athol Yates, is teaching in the United Arab Emirates. He writes and talks and lectures about security and disaster management. And he's joining me now live from there. So I will bring him in on screen now. Uh, so good afternoon, Athol. How are you today? Hello, I'm well, thank you. So the first question is, is how on earth did you discover this story of locusts? Because it's something I've read extensively about World War II and the Middle East and North Africa and the Mediterranean. And it's just something that I don't ever remember popping up in anything I've read. So, so was it something that you came across kind of by your work from going, you know, looking at the sort of modern times going backwards? How, how did you discover the, the whole concept of locusts in World War II? Well, I'm an active member in Abu Dhabi of the Natural History Group, which is one who's interested in local history and also the natural environment. And uh, we travel around the UAE looking at plants and animals. And one of the things I came across was uh, locusts, because it's been a perennial issue here. Uh, and I happen to remember seeing something in one of the um, Gulf administration reports from the Second World War period when I was looking at the Sharjah Air Base and it mentioned locusts and uh, then that led me down this path of discovering the impact of locusts locally in the UAE and then I discovered it was much more a wider problem that uh, that was a core focus or a significant focus of the Middle East command in the, in the Second World War. And that's obviously what you're going to be telling us about today. And I think, you know, for those watching, we associate famine with war. I mean, the show I did a couple of nights ago about the scorched earth policy in the Eastern, Eastern Europe, of course, famine and suffering and human, human inability to feed themselves becomes an issue there. But I don't think that I'd ever really realised that there was this problem of a famine caused by, by, by insects, by creatures. And uh, in World War II, of course, it all comes down to logistics and supplies and feeding people and supplying armies and supplying the populations of the areas where the battles were taking place. And as we talk about, in, well, you'll be talking about in the, the Middle East, lots of populations there who weren't really involved in the conflict. Some were, some weren't, but they are absolutely involved in the humanitarian aspect of it because of the, the strain on resources. I mean, I live in Normandy, where Normandy's farms took about 15 years after World War II to recover because they've been over overworked during the occupation. So something like a plague of locusts coming in the middle of a, an era when the war the war is raging is about the worst time that, that could possibly happen. But we will... Fire up your PowerPoint presentation because you've come armed with, with the things to talk about. And folks, today what we're going to do is we'll do questions at the end, if indeed there are any, because I'm assuming most of you watching, hello, Willie, hello, William, hello, George, Dean, others, you probably don't know much about this subject. So I'm assuming that we, it'll all be covered in the presentation. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Yates now to kind of take us through this, this really fascinating period. So, so over to you, Athol. Thank you. So let me set the scene then, or let me give the big picture about the locusts issue. So the Middle East was a large area of operations at various times, and it was an area that was under, large parts of it was under imperial control. Now the populations, some places weren't particularly uh, positive towards the British and the ally and, and other imperial powers more broadly. So what the issue was is if there was an, a locusts, the allies had two really, uh, sorry, there was a locust plague that decimated local food production. The allies were in this terrible predicament where they had the problem of either letting the local people starve and if they did, then what the issue would be 
is that they would then be faced with potential uprisings there or they would be faced with the diversion of foodstuffs that were desperately mm. needed in other theatres. So that was the bigger picture for it. So now let me delve into the actual um, presentation and then we'll go to questions and answers, as you've mentioned. So it's divided into two parts. The first is understanding the locust and the locust plague problem, and the second is the actual campaign. So what we're talking about here is the locusts, and they can be about an inch, two inches long, the desert locusts. That's what they look like. The issues are not when there's ones or twos, but when there's billions of them. They go through a life cycle and they start off with the egg. Um, and what you see is that they go through, then they can't, they, the egg's laid, it's an egg sac, and it's laid in the ground in the, in the sand dunes generally, uh, or soft soil. Then they pop out, they go through a hopper stage, and uh, then they pop, uh, then they come to a wind stage or the adult stage. And that can be generally from egg uh to adult stage it's about 50 days now that time period is really important then once they take flight then they can fly if there's a good wind uh up to 200 kilometers in a day then they land and they lay eggs and then the cycle repeats now this is what the see the, the dark matter there on the sand dune that is actually uh, tens of thousands of these hoppers. So they're hoppers because they can't fly. They haven't developed the wings. So they form in very large groups and just meander along, hopping along the ground, eating everything. So this is the time where you have to intercept them because once they're in the air, it was impossible in those days to intercept them because there was no aerial spraying like there is today. Okay, so the plagues aren't in one area. Uh, they're in lots of different areas simultaneously and they can move very large dif different distances. So we're particularly interested in the ones that generally started in uh, northeast Africa, moved across the Arabian Peninsula into Persia, um, India, and then they could often come backwards as well, depending on the prevailing wind. Now, what the issue is, is that if there's a good, if there's a good uh, series of wet seasons, then it starts to build up the numbers over multiple generations that can then lead to these billion locust swarms. Okay, the swarms and the and plagues are a natural occurring event. They don't occur every year, they occur in uh, groups of years. So you get a cycle. And this cycle was known by the early 90s. 1900s and in 41 they started to notice there was a cycle and they knew it would last and as it built up it would the threat of locusts uh, damage would become more and more okay so what you're looking at here is a a um example of one of the easiest ways to deal with the eggs and destroy them is in the ground and involves digging them up and by disturbing them and putting them on the uh, topsoil, then the sun dries out and the eggs will fail to hatch. So that was one common method. Um, as it got more sophisticated, you could use a plow if you knew where they were. But of course, this points out the need to know where they are in the egg laying area time, which means you need to have on the ground intelligence officers who could wander around and identify the climactic or whether it local, uh, local breeding environment, if it was suitable, watch where they were landing, uh, the fully grown uh, insects, and then where they were planting them. Um, the other very common method, uh, and that was the one that was used mainly in the, uh, during the Second World War in the Middle East anti-locust campaign, was spreading of bait. So that bait uh, would have been a, it's got a couple of percent uh, uh, an arsenic in it, and they spread it around and it's in bran generally. And then the hoppers eat it and about 90 hours later, they'll generally die from ingesting that poison. Now, again, that required you to be able to deploy people who could spread this material 
um, and they had to have that material. And bran is pretty, uh, got a low density, so it's great volume. Uh, and they had to ship it in quite large quantities, which meant a lot of vehicles. Okay, now we've got moving to the actual military operation. The map you're looking at is of the Arabian Peninsula um, and parts of the Middle East, but the green shows you the major agricultural areas. Now, that's generally the sites where the breeding occurs because that's generally where there's vegetation and rain. So the, the, hop, the fully grown insects will lay in those conditions where they think there's going to be vegetation uh, in, uh, what, uh, 14 days after, 14 to 20 days after the eggs hatch they come out in the hopper form the hoppers have to last then for up to 50 days of eating lots of vegetation before they can take wings so generally that's where they uh, the green areas is where the hatchery areas were quite large at that stage there was no military operations in the area there was very very little intelligence and on the ground um, British in particular um, representation. So there was very little knowledge about local conditions. So what the military operation uh, involved in, it was run out of Cairo, divided into two, under the control of two forces. One was the Middle East Command and one was the, um, was a Persia and Iraq Command. Um, they ran it and what they did is they deployed three key groups. Uh, one in the east and uh, central Saudi Arabia that also covered Amman and the Trucial States. Um, can you see my cursor? The pointer uh, doesn't work with the system, Apple, and you have to okay. describe where you're printing. Okay, so um, Saudi Arabia is the big white area in general. Top right... Um, sort of mid-right in the green areas uh, above the word Arabia, yep, uh, is the Trucial States, which is the United Arab Emirates today, and the darker green area in the light area is um, Oman. Right. So that was one area. The other area was the Nafad region, which is in sort of north-central uh, Saudi Arabia, and the third one is the Hejaz region. And in, so there was these three teams. Um, the, they were fundamentally uh, British Army supplied teams. They were all motorised, of course, rather than camels. They depended on a lot of pre-positioning supplies. So those supplies had to be shipped in in um, sort of October, November, because the breeding star occurred in December onwards. And it required a lot of intelligence on the ground intelligence. Now, this was a, all of these things were really challenging because the preposition of supplies were in areas where there was very little British presence or let alone any other allied pre presence. So there was at that stage, um, air bases in Bahrain and Sharjah because that was an important air route to India and beyond. And that is probably all there was at that stage. So there really wasn't any other facilities. Westerners weren't welcome in Saudi Arabia at the time. So the deal, a deal had to be made with the uh, King of Saudi Arabia to allow them to go in. And the intelligence collection was particularly problematic because what it meant was a whole lot of white men wandering around the country where Westerners were not welcome. Okay, the operational structure was in general, the British military out of Cairo provided the logistics for it. So that meant trucks, signals, maintenance, key personnel. There was also a whole lot of desert locust officers. Well, there's probably only about four of them for the entire campaign. Um, and they were members of the uh, Middle East anti-locust unit which was a small group within under the paramilitary um, Middle East Supply Centre based in Cairo which was the logistics arm that provide that supported our uh, British forces um, in the Middle East in general. Uh, the local rulers uh, 
whether they were sheikhs of the true states or the Sultan of Muscat and Amman or the King of Saudi Arabia. They provided essential political support to allow the British military personnel to uh, operate as well as the Desert Locust, op uh, Desert Locust officers. And also there needed to be large numbers of local labourers who were actually engaged to spread the bait. Hmm. Just one question, so if, now, I may. If, I, if I just ask one question. You talked about those earlier, you know, those the, 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 the eras where there'd been these predicted kind of phases of seven or eight years of locust problems. Um, I remember reading at one point how migratory birds in World War II were using different routes because there was lots of concentration of gunfire and artillery in certain places. Did the actual war happening in that area in any way affect what locusts were doing? Were they moving differently? Is that a stupid question or am I, am I asking something that isn't completely ridiculous? Uh, no, the, 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 the very limited military operations in, that, in East Africa, Northeast Africa and the Arabian Peninsula had no impact whatsoever on them because the locusts just moved with the wind. And yeah, so okay. you can't even predict where they're moving because it changes each year because the winds change ever so slightly each year. Okay, thanks. So, uh, here we have the, the the details of the British Army contingent that was supplied just for uh, what 40, uh, 40, yeah, from 42 to 44. So there was two different campaigns. The first campaign from 42 to 43 was a trial uh, to see if this new concept would work. Um, and that had about 30 vehicles. The, as you can see, the following year, it ramped up tenfold. And that's because there was both greater uh, increased availability of personnel, uh, but there was also, this was the decisive year where they really needed to kill the locusts to prevent um, famine occurring uh, in the subsequent years. So you can see what they were, most uh, mostly three tons trucks plus some large uh, 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 Mack trucks for maintenance and, and tank transporter type vehicles. Uh, signalers, logistic quartermasters, staff officers who didn't go out in the field, they were mainly based at the headquarters or the local deployed headquarters and uh, medical personnel because there was quite a lot of uh, illness associated with the environment you were working in it was very remote um there uh, and what's missing from this is the raf contingent because they were also involved but they were purely uh logistic support because as i mentioned there was no aerial spraying one side note for those who are interested in um air force issues they tried at that stage also to ask the pilots who were who were transporting aircraft to the burma chinese front at the time to watch out for any swarms that they saw um but uh, it to, and then to report them upon their landing you know at charge of bahrain iraq or wherever or um karachi jask uh, but it turned out that that was not a uh, practical effort and it was discontinued after a um, trial of a couple of weeks. Okay, now I'm going to show you some pictures of what the place actually looked like and what the activity involved. So here you're looking at a, um, a convoy of one of the three uh, deployed teams. And what you're looking at here is the typical sorts of environment they would be going through um, on gravel plains rather than sand dunes because they were quite difficult to pass by heavier vehicles without sand tyres at that stage. And here's what a, the, one of the, the British teams would look like. So these would be the logistics teams that went with one of the convoys. Now, in Saudi Arabia, because of the sensitivities of having Westerners, they weren't allowed to, the British personnel weren't allowed to wear British headgear or any British uh, insignia 
So you, they were uh, had to wear local attire, and the officers had different um, headbands. The as you can see, the headdresses. I think it was gold from memory for the officers, and the other ranks had a different colour. That was about the only marking of uh, rank. Uh, also, the officers and I think senior NCOs were allowed to carry sidearms of uh, pistols only. That's Saudi Arabia. In places like the Trucial States and Amman, they were they could go fully armed if they needed to be. Um, just an example of the uh, couple of the guys and what they'd be wearing uh, on their uh, part of the campaign. Now, this is an interesting. There's going to be two shots that shows you the, um, the the density of the hoppers. So this is a cameraman lying, obviously, in front of a truck, and you can see all the little black dots on top of him. That's the hoppers. Here's another one, even more dense. They're densely packed. The hoppers are on this chap. Okay, particularly harsh environment. Um, humidity could be high. Uh, areas uh, particularly close to the coast, the sand is uh, very salty and corrosive for it. Uh, vehicles could have quite a limited life because of the terrain and you required a lot of maintenance, hence why there was quite a, a strong logistics team that went with them. Um, you would see, you saw these sorts of things, whether these were staged or not, uh, but you would find quite a lot of these markings. Because, of course, the deserts had no markings at all because there was no roads at that stage. Mm. Uh, they're not even tracks. You could follow other vehicles that had gone through, but, of course, once the wind got up, they, they would disappear completely as well. Okay, so here we're looking at a loads of the bait being um, taken out of some store, uh, hail in, in Saudi Arabia, and loaded into the back of the truck. So then the truck uh, would carry uh, these bales of, um, of uh, bait, and then often the trucks would go out with one or two other trucks full of local workers. And then once they went to a site, then they, where there were hoppers, they would dismount. And um, if it was in sandy type areas, then they might have to carry the bales quite a significant distance up, up and down sand dunes until they get to the place where they saw these swarms of hoppers. And then you would, um, they would then by hand spread the, spread the bait. Uh, so close up of them. So you can see they're quite bulky. Um, an interesting one, uh, it's the only shot I've come across where it had American vehicles uh, supplied. Um, now, that probably came across in, in, in this area. Um, the logistics was being supported by Middle Eastern Command rather than um, a Persian Iraq Command, so that may explain why they had uh, jeeps. Yep, uh, so these are yeah, just the hoppers, another a band of hoppers. Yeah, so you need you needed to find these these things. You needed to have guys who were in the region, uh, what up to four or five weeks beforehand, who were monitoring the weather, because of course the hoppers then would then take that long to appear and and start moving, and so it required quite a lot of knowledge, local knowledge, uh, which was really difficult to come by. So you had often the um, desert control officers functioning just like intelligence officers, talking to the local tribes, local sheikhs, um, uh, Bedouin herders, saying where do they normally appear or what's the, what's the condition of the pasture or the fodder in these areas, you know, two weeks, three weeks ago. And only based on that, then, would they be able to identify where these likely areas were. And then four weeks later, they would have to send the teams out to start seeing if they could actually see them and spread around the bait. So, in conclusion, what it was a highly successful campaign. 
the guys, the, the numbers that were in, involved were about for the campaign from 43 to 44, something like 800 British Army personnel, some 300 vehicles, 105 civilians, and uh, another 40 civilian vehicles. So you can see the ma vast majority of the operation was, was uh, the logistics was supplied by the British Army. It was successful in that it really decimated the hopper population, which meant that the following years, the uh, locust plagues did not swarm in the numbers that, that were expected. Hence, the local uh, agricultural sector for both farm and fodder, fodder for camels, goats, donkeys mm -hmm. and sheep, uh, survived. Therefore, there was no need to ship any food there. So therefore, the food was released for the rest of the region and they didn't suffer the uh, likelihood of internal um, uh, strife that would have consumed more British or allied so soldiers in um, internal security missions. So it was really quite successful. And like a lot of successful operations, you, re you really don't hear much about them because things went on normal. Had it failed, then we could have had some quite significant consequences. Now, what was interesting in 43, when when the um, they had a conference in Cairo with the uh, British military oh, allied uh, uh, allied groups, they the RAF at that stage said that fighting the locusts was only second in importance to fighting the enemy. So it really was recognised at that point as a significant issue. Um, the fact that they were able to do it so successfully with such minimum resources was, was truly quite amazing. Um, mm. So a footnote to it, unfortunately, after 44, when the war was uh, progressing, moving elsewhere where the focus was and the Middle East became somewhat of a, just a... Uh, uh, a supply part of the supply chain uh, to the Pacific, to the Indian Pacific theatre, the, the focus on the locust declined and it returned to what it had been pre-war, which was really isolated efforts that were not particularly successful. So uh, I would conclude by saying I think it's a, a very interesting campaign and one that leveraged military capability to achieve something that was really quite important for the local population and for the war effort overall. Well, brilliant. Um, thank you very much. And we'll do some questions now. Um, and it, uh, one of the things I was going to ask you, but you've already kind of half covered it, is because I'm going to count this essentially as special forces. I know when we hear the word special forces, we think of blowing things up and, and, and you know, long range desert group. But this is a specially mounted operation of specialists to deal with a specific problem. So I think it comes under the banner of special forces. And I think the question I often ask when I have guests on about special forces, how do you how do you measure success? Because sometimes it's about morale in the terms of early commando missions. Sometimes it's it's about kind of making the Germans fear something happening. But this, because it was it was perceived to be successful, but it's preventative rather than you know. Cause we, I I thought it was going to be more about kind of dealing with the swarms of flying locusts rather than dealing with the hoppers on the ground. So because it was preventative, it's maybe harder to judge what would have happened if they hadn't done it. But um, so, but there has there been studies done because I suppose the long term effect is going to be 10 and 20 years later when the next plagues come around as whether or not there was enough data to say that this, this work in World War II was significant. Mm. So I think the success of it only relates to the World War II period right. and that's because they could bring together all of the, the political entities plus the British logistics activities right. to support it. See, one of the things that happened after the war, particularly in Saudi Arabia, there was a great deal of, um, what would you call it, um, anti-imperialism. And what Britain wanted to do was to continue the counter-locust counter efforts by 
helping the local, this is the Saudi or the um, I don't know, Egyptians, uh, Jordanians, whoever it was, to build up their own capacity to do it. However, Britain wanted to supply the uh, leadership for it, particularly the uh, locust control officers. Now, these are the officers who would have wandered around. Now, uh, Ibn Saud was particularly concerned that if they did that, they would be collecting intelligence. So they weren't keen of it and they killed off that effort. And as it turned out, uh, archival records do show that sure enough, they were using the collection, the information collected for the locust activities as part of an intelligence collection activity on the terrain and the people uh, of um, uh, the Arabian Peninsula. So it would take until uh, really 60s and 70s before there was local um, capacity developed in countering the locusts plus the regional coordination because, of course, locusts do not recognise borders. They fly across yeah. it. And so unless you're going to fight in a holistic way, it's really not much point fighting at all. Right. So talking about the, uh, thank you for that, the, the, the crossing borders. I mean, you were talking about these teams going out. You, you explained about how they would have the locals helping out tribesmen, you know, for three or four weeks in advance, then come out with the teams with the poison. Um, I'm assuming that most of the people they're encountering in the different countries, because you said it extends from Egypt across to, the, to Saudi Arabia, is that they're at least not resisting the arrival of these British teams. They they may not fully understand what's going on, but that, was there any, any kind of active resistance? Were they ever shot at or, or forbidden entry or denied access? Uh, yes, they were. And you could imagine that some people, they some locals, some Bedus, uh, down in remote parts of Saudi had not even seen a vehicle before. And then all right. of a sudden some guys turn up wearing parrot uniforms that you could only interpret for them. They saw it as a military. They yep. uh, have long remembered campaigns of the unification of Saudi, the fights with um, you know, Kuwait, uh, uh, Iraq and so on. So they were quite sceptical about it, which was real. So it was really important that they had the political support of the local ruler behind them as they deployed. Uh, but sometimes that person or the people, the the political representatives of the ruler weren't there, so they were denied access to it. I'm not aware of any shooting, and I suspect that's because they would have realised that they would have the counter, uh, the fighting, the the response would have been quite harsh. But in yeah. general, uh, because they were sensitive to not. To, to the local demands, they would have pulled back. The local representative would have gone in the next day, smoothed it over, had uh, dates and coffee in the local Bedouin tent, would have been smoothed over and they would have been allowed to proceed. Okay. I'm um, got a question from Scott Grimwood, a regular viewer. Uh, what was done to prevent the local livestock from getting at the locust state? Excellent question. Um, because one of the early reasons for the hostility uh, when they started using bait was the concern that the camels would not, would eat it and get sick. Um, however, it appears that the, uh, it didn't actually cause them unless they got access to quite large quantities of it. Uh, so really it wasn't an issue. They spread it and disappeared fairly quickly. Right. Okay. My next question, I don't know about how it, it connects to what I asked earlier, but it's about this idea of, again, measuring the success, because we've talked a lot about 1945 and 1946 globally being just a massive shortage of food. We talk about the displacement camps in Europe. There's there's all these populations that have now been freed from the various campaigns that are desperately hungry. Um, if this lo anti-locust campaign hadn't been going on, um, have, do you have any idea what sort of tonnage of food would have needed to be brought into some of these places from elsewhere? And, and you know, is it, are we talking, you know, thousands of tons or hundreds of tons or tens of thousands of tons? What what sort of population are we talking about that might have been affected by by the results of locusts had this scheme not been in, uh, operating? 
Okay, so I can, I'll only answer that partially looking at the populations of the Trucial states and Amman and probably main areas of Saudi. So these areas are pretty low density in populations. They have, but however, they depended significantly on imported um, staples, no, notably rice and grains. While there was some self-sufficiency, um, there was at that stage a big dependence on India as a supplier. So had the loaded Scott in decimated India's uh, food production, that would have had even a, a much bigger uh, impact. And of course, there was some food shortages from when was that late 30s, the famines uh, in India. But the anyway, but the numbers were not that significant in in the areas I've just mentioned. Now we're talking maybe about forty thousand people, fifty thousand in the entire uh, Trucial states or the UAE today. Uh, might have been I don't know in Bahrain and Qatar, maybe forty thousand as well. So it wasn't very large numbers. Um, Saudi was more of a problem because, of course, if there was food shortages there, they would do what they did in the 20s, and that's head up towards the tribal groups, tribal Bedouins would have, would have head north. And that would have caused big problems uh, in um, Iraq, uh, Transjordan, and uh, so on. So you could have had significant issues there. Uh, the local loss of life, in down though in Amman and the Trucial States, yeah, it would have been tragic, but it wouldn't have had a great impact on regional instability. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Sean Martin, and it would be, would poisoning the locusts pose a risk to rendering any water sources, sources unusable as locusts would be drawn to oases? If so, was that factored into the operational planning? Yeah, um, from my understanding of it was that there was no residual problems with the arsenic. The concentration was quite low. The locusts died generally in 90 hours and they degraded and it didn't seem to have any pollution of surface water or the aquifers. I've not seen anything about that at all. And even today, it's not an issue that I've uh, seen at all in the counter locust spraying activities. Okay, thank you. And my next question is going to be, you, you've presented on this over there in the United Arab Emirates. You presented on it with me. You've been on various podcasts. Is this a story that is known within, for example, Saudi Arabia and where you, where you live, or is it a story that they it's new to them as well? Obviously, it's new to me and my audience, but is it a story that, that you're finding is new to everybody you tell it to? Yes, it's not well known here because once the aerial um, anti-locust activities got underway, 60s and 70s, there really hasn't been any significant locust plague since then. Now, the change, though, in, in recent years, has there has been a significant change and there are likelihoods, no, sorry, there's increasing lo numbers of locust swarms occurring. And that's principally because of the Yemen conflict and the instability in the Horn of Africa. Because of the Yemen conflict, it's been impossible for United Nations or even local um, counter-locust patrols to go in to identify where they are laying and killing them, let alone spraying them. That's just been in, impossible to do. So we have a couple of um, large cyclones over the last couple of years, dumped huge amounts of water, lots of vegetation, hence that's been an ideal breeding spot. They've bred in the Horn of Africa, flown to Yemen, rebred there, and then they've flown onwards. So we've had some small locust plagues even in the UAE. So people now are starting to get interested again in locusts. Uh, but because they haven't seen them in the previous, you know, four decades, this history is completely forgotten. Okay. And my the next question is, you know, we're going back to that slide there of the various other plagues that existed. Is that, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, you said that this was kind of recognised in 1941 that there there was the beginning of this this locust cycle. Now I'm thinking about the British Army in 1941, where it is basically 
struggling in every theater at this point. This is the part of the war where it's still going very badly. Singapore falls and, and you know, the, the, the Battle of the Atlantic is arguably being lost. Um, with this, For someone to have noticed at a high level that this was significant, there must have been someone very persuasive, very very um, engaging at, at, at a local level who manages to get this idea through to someone high enough that the British Army acts on this. Because it, it, there's a lot of cases in World War II where we're rather shutting the door after the, the horse is bolted. It seems to me from what you've said is that clearly the British Army were, were, were in on this quite quickly. So is there some kind of important figure at the beginning of this who was able to get memos onto the right desks uh, and, and to be seen by the right people? Okay, so the answer to that is that it's important to remember that Britain had, had an empire at that time in the, in the 40s. So despite the war, it still had to manage the empire. And there's lots yeah. of parts of the empire that was quite peaceful. Now, in the lead up to the empire, Britain, um, under some naturalists, investigated um, and were running the Middle East campaign against the locusts. They were doing a lot of scientific work in, in the region. They were coming here and they had um, the preliminary desert, uh, the, the early desert um, locust patrol officers. They were here collecting samples. They had just discovered where these desert, what these desert locust swarms were. Because up until oh, maybe it's about 1930, they didn't even realise that the desert locusts in the swarms was not a unique species. It actually is a standard desert species that goes through a gregarious cycle and forms swarms. And when it forms swarms, it changes its colour and its physiology, like it's physically a different species. So anyway, all of this was going on. This was being led by uh, empire researchers and so the war occurred. These guys were still doing their work, albeit with less resources. Um, and so they had the infrastructure. They were based in London. They were convincing um, people in the war, I'm not sure if it was the war office or where it was at the stage, uh, about this issue. And um, then the, it might have been the colonial office or the foreign office, I'm not sure which, uh, they recognised the instability that was likely to be caused by famine in the region and therefore it got put onto the political military agenda then it got to uh, there was a large conference in Cairo I think in 42 brought in the military then the military were told hey you guys need to fix this because another point to really that's important to remember is that the particularly the military in the Arabian Gulf region was under political control and it had been since the end of the First World War. It wasn't under a military control. They were there to support political decisions and a political officer had great influence by the foreign office or the colonial office. And so uh, the military in the Middle East then responded to the political need rather than reacting because they identified it as a military need right okay so yeah so it would have been an, if there wasn't a war this would have been an issue that the british empire was worried about anyway but the level of worry increases because of this fear you said at the beginning of potential uprising amongst people, locals and what have you and the and the, the extra needs of of the war effort so it was something that was going on anyway so my last question i think we will bring it to an end is is I'm now intrigued as to what other things were going on in that part of the world. Yeah, you know, because you know, we talk a lot about on the channel about intelligence and how you know the Allies have all these aerial photos of the places in Europe they're gonna be landing forces and what have you. I wonder what other departments there were that were gauging information about other aspects, you know, water supplies, disease, um, uh, local cultures and customs and things, because no, we know that a lot of the fledgling commando units, the Long Range Desert Group and SAS, these are made up of people from, you know, Cambridge and Oxford Dons and things who'd been living in the Middle East and North Africa in the 1920s and 30s. So I'm now wondering what else was going on that we haven't discovered yet. Is there anything else you you kind of, in researching this, were there any other kind of weird, obscure departments you discovered? 
Well, what there was was an ongoing huge intelligence collection effort, and that was political, tribal, geographic, social intelligence, and that uh, was essential because remember that the to, to run the empire, you needed lines of communication and that in the 20s had become aerial based. So they established a whole lot of air stations along the route. So you could fly all the way from England to India by the Arabian coast. So that was there. You also had um, by, uh, well, of course, there was the Italians and large naval submarine and surface fleet in the Horn of Africa in, uh, when they entered the war. So you had them. Um, operating in the Arabian Sea area and the entire Indian Ocean, but particularly there of concern. You had the uh, Americans bringing in material into Persia for supply lend lease lines up to the north. Um, we've just finished a paper looking at uh, the the World War II in the Arabian Gulf itself, not the peninsula, but the Gulf, which was fascinating because it's one of the few zones where you had all three Axis parties at different times being involved. You had the Germans attacking, you had the Italians dropping bombs in it, and you had the um, Japanese uh, potentially landing uh, forces by submarines, all to stop the oil flow out of um, Iran and uh, Bahrain. Right. Now, brilliant answer. And we've got a question here, which I'm going to ask, I'm going to phrase slightly differently. And Kevin Jones is asking about was Saudi Arabia in any way pro German as the country was in the British colony? But I'm going to expand that to say, you know, in the, in the countries in that region there, I, it might have changed as the war progressed. But what was their feeling generally about the war? Was it something that they didn't want to be part of? Were they mostly loyal to the one side or the other? Were they kind of gauging it on a on a month by month basis? What what was the reaction around there generally to this to this conflict? Yeah, that's actually a podcast you need to pursue. Yeah, I feel like it's a podcast. Yeah, there yeah. is no simple answer. It was a yeah. combination of history, pragmatism, and to some degree, ideology. And it depends where you look at at a particular time. Okay, well, we'll we'll do that perhaps another few another future show. And then my last question is just a simple one to answer: is you know, we had. I think you're the person from the twenty seventh different country that's joined my or living in the twenty seventh different country that's joining my show, which is is great, but. If you were to go into a, a bookstore near you, is there a large military history section? Is it something people are reading about? If they're reading, do they read British authors, American authors? Um, is, is there any interest in World War II at all there? Uh, the answer is the there is quite limited bookshops here, but it's growing because there hasn't historically been a reading culture. Uh, right. There are lots of expats here, and so you have your Borders and your Waterstone-type standard bookshops. Uh, in terms of military history, there has been no local military history books available at all until I published one, uh, what, two years ago with Hellion that what looked at the military and police forces of the Gulf, and I've now done another book with Hellion, which is uh, looked uh, that's detailed the history of the UAE armed forces because it's had a spectacular rise from nothing over a 50 year period. And our next major project is going to be a book on World War II and um, it's going to look at the little known um, aviation supply chain in this region in the Second World War. So that was from the Americans and the British to supply troops and material for the Burma Chinese front. Yeah, I'm I'm sensing a future show if you'd like to come back there, <laughs> Dr. Yates. That that's interesting because you know that what you know, I'll, I'll bring things to end in a minute. One of the things that we that we love and our audience love is that undiscovery uh, discovery of sectors and the theatres that we just didn't know about. And as much as I like doing shows on Operation Market Garden and D Day and Midway. There's nothing quite like getting our teeth into something that people the way you feel you're completely walking on virgin snow and, and learning something new because 
you know, the world part of the of the World War Two was because it was a t totally glo global conflict, and there are still massively underrepresented campaigns amongst our knowledge base, you know, and we keep writing about the same things again and again. How many more documentaries do the British need to make about the dam busters? <laughs> you know, do, we, do we need any more? And yet there's these entire sectors and countries and aspects that are just un under underexplored. So I will extend the invitation to you to come back and talk about the, the area in, a, in, a, in another fashion. So I'll just take you off screen for a second, tell people we're coming up later. I'll bring you back on in a minute. So um, folks, this, if you remember, was the first of a double bill today. We are co continuing our look at the Germans at war later on. So 7 p.m. UK time, Michael J. Stout is joining me from the USA to talk about the Luftwaffe Ground Division, which was really um, interesting. It was the Germans' desperation to churn out more people to fight on the ground. So they converted uh, the blue-wearing Luftwaffe guys to, to ground troops. That would be a really fascinating presentation. If you are new to the channel, I always say don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget to uh, consider becoming a patron or a member. I will add the link later to, to Dr. Yates' uh, recent books, even if they're not, say, not completely about World War II. I'll add them to the description later on. And thank you for watching, everybody. I'll bring Athol in just to say good, good afternoon. So it's been fantastic. So I've, I've learned a lot. It's been um, enlightening, and people have enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, I, I, with our first ever insect diagram on World War II TV. So that, that's, that's a first. So uh, have you enjoyed talking to our happy bunch of people? Yes, it was very delightful. It's always interesting to find people who are, are, are interested in and sort of the eclecticness of some aspects of the peripheral fronts, which is what I like to cover in it. Um, there's also, if you're interested in this, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a copy of the paper that outlines this history in case you haven't seen it. And you can put yep. that, a, a link to that as well. Oh, oh, yeah, people have asked about a link to that, so I'll add that later on. So, brilliant. It's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. So, this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying, I will see you all again later, folks. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.